Thanks so much for coming. Excited to have you on. Drones. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So drones, what's the deal? Why did you get, your, your career is based around drones at this point. What was, the, what was the origin story? What got you excited? So I was uh, an undergraduate at Bard College. It's a small liberal arts school in upstate New York. And I was a history major. And I was in New York City one summer between my junior year and my senior year doing an internship. And I was sitting in a bar uh, with a friend. Now, for a couple of years, I had been reading the New York Times at breakfast every day. And it felt like every week there was a story about drones, particularly drones being used to carry out targeted strikes uh, in Pakistan predominantly, but also in Somalia and Yemen. Um, there was also talk about drones being used for civilian commercial purposes in, in the US airspace system. Admittedly, they're not the same types of drones that, that the civilian ones are much smaller, the military ones very large. But I just was fascinated by this technology. I felt like it raised all of these questions that were so urgent and yet also unfamiliar. And somehow sitting in that bar, I just got a flash of inspiration and I decided that Bard College, the university where I was studying, needed to study this topic. They needed to look into it because I felt like we had the best sort of approach to studying complex topics like this. And so I said, we're going to create a center for the study of the drone right there at Bard College. And uh, it started out just as a sort of a seminar series. We created a little blog. And then by the time I graduated in May of 2013, so about eight months later, uh, the topic had just kind of blown up. And it felt like we needed to keep going. And so I, I continued working for the college uh, the day after I graduated. That was uh, six years ago. And the, the issue has only become more complicated, more difficult, more challenging, and more urgent. I mean, just this morning, we received news that Iran has shot down a very large U.S. spy drone uh, over the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, I mean, this is uncharted territory. And how do we, how do we think about that? We'll, we'll get to some other stuff as well, but shooting down a drone, it's much less than shooting down a plane with people in it. And yet, is that, a, is that an act of war? Is that an act of, is that an act of get off my property, Clint Eastwood style? What is that? Oh, it's a really tricky question and the jury's still out. This is the first time that a U.S. adversary has shot down such a large U.S. drone uh, and certainly the first time that one has shot down a drone uh, in the midst of such a tense moment in the relationship between these two countries. Um, you're right that there's a somewhat uh, lower threshold in this case because there were no US service members aboard that aircraft. That being said, you know, there have been cases where uh, US aircraft with pilots on board have been shot down and the US has not retaliated either. So it's a very tricky geopolitical strategic uh, calculation that's made. And that's a discussion that is literally happening right now in the White House, in the National Security Council. Uh, my guess is that while it will escalate the situation somewhat, uh, it will not be the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I don't think this will be the, 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 the match that lit up the whole war. Are we talking an angry tweet? Are we talking sanctions? Are we talking something more? There has already been an angry tweet. Uh, I'm sure there's been like 15. Yeah, President Trump said Iran should not have done that. Um, we'll have to see. Uh, you know, I, I'm, there will be some kind of reaction. I mean, this is a $130 million drone. It is one of the most expensive aircraft in the U.S. arsenal. Um, you don't shoot one of those birds down and get off scot-free. 
it's like scratching the scratching the dick that drives the Lamborghini to the to the bar. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> there's some extra rules involved, but then yeah, the the, fl- the flip side's even bigger. So shooting down a drone problematic. Mm. Using a drone to shoot down civilians or combatants more problematic and questionable. How do you think about it on the military side? We'll get into commercial eventually. Sure. It's, it, it's challenging. In theory, uh, sh- striking a target with a drone that has a missile aboard it is no different to using a manned aircraft or someone with a sniper rifle. Um, There's no risk though. Or, or a helicopter gunship. Exactly. So it really depends on the context. Um, if it's the, 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 the areas where the use of drones has been most controversial is um, in areas where the U.S. is technically not at war. Right? Because the U.S. is not at war in these areas, um, it can use drones without requiring a the sort of okay from Congress. Um, and that raises the question of whether a country by using drones can just fight its wars wherever it wants, however it wants, and whenever it wants. Um, and, and that is tremendously problematic. Um, it's like the, a CIA the, hitman that gets caught on YouTube. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's very much like that. Um, there's also the, the, the strategic side of it. You know, is it uh, prudent to uh, kill hundreds of people with drones um, as a way to uh, really take apart an, an enemy terrorist organization? Because there are many who say that it only makes the problem worse. Uh, uh, a young a teenager, say, uh, sees their family members or their neighbors being killed with drones, and they say, "Hey, you know, the, the U.S. shouldn't be doing this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna join the cause. I'm, I'm, I'm going to join this organization. In a way, it could potentially make these organizations um, stronger." And then uh, a third question that is that makes this also so complex and unfamiliar is that these drones are operated from very, very far away. So the pilots who are operating a lot of these drones are actually within the United States and they're controlling aircraft that are six, 7,000 miles away. There are lots of concerns that because the soldiers are so far removed from what's happening on the ground, they don't take it as seriously, perhaps, as a Marine with a sniper rifle who is closer to the action. Uh, they might be a little bit more flippant about hitting that, that, that button uh, to fire the missile. But I've spoken to a lot of drone pilots and they will assure you that that's not the case. In fact, they say that they spend a lot more time staring at their targets, getting to know them, than pretty much any other kind of pilot because a jet fighter flies over the target, drops the bombs, and, and then it's gone. But a, a drone pilot may be staring at a target for days and weeks on end. There are many reports of drone pilots even having forms of PTSD uh, from their experiences. Um, so, But all that very- implies there's a pilot in the loop, which in the future, will that even be the case? You know, I, I think it's going to be a very long time until uh, the the Pentagon is comfortable saying, okay, drone, go to this general area and kill who, whichever enemy you find who you think is probably a legitimate target. Um, you know, generally, military commanders like to have very tight control over their, over their, over their people. You know, over over the, the, the aircraft and weapons that they're deploying. They don't want soldiers going AWOL. They don't want soldiers acting without accountability. Um, and I don't think we're going to, for at least a few years, be at that point where a commander can trust a robotic drone that much to that extent. 
but certain things are going to be automated. So it's going to only be a couple of years until uh, US jet fighters that do have a pilot inside will be accompanied by what are called loyal wingmen, which are these jet drones that can sort of act as flying accomplices. So the pilot might say, okay, uh, loyal wingman drone number one, you go and explore that area and tell me if you see anything suspicious and relay the video back to me. Drone number two, you go and uh, jam those enemy radars so that they don't see me and shoot me down. It's a way of sort of extending human capacity rather than replacing the human whole hog. But let's play devil's advocate. The only thing worse than making a mistake is trying to is falling up behind let's say let's say putin puts uh, autonomous drones with guns into the battlefield how quickly are people going to think about oh well we need to have that too otherwise we're behind it's the it's the steroids in competition argument yeah that's that's certainly the concern there is a lot of discussion about um how AI will give rise to a new arms race, the likes of which we haven't seen since the height of the Cold War. Um, but I would temper some of those points with the fact that AI at the moment doesn't seem to really be up to that standard. Uh, I, I know Putin has declared that whoever is the leader in AI will be the leader of the world. Uh, th that's a little bit overblown because yes, a country may deploy, you know, autonomous warbots into the battlefield, but that doesn't mean that its adversaries only option is to deploy warbots of its own. There are other factors at play. There are other ways that you can do damage with non robotic technology that continue to be very, very effective and will continue to be effective even in the context of having, you know, uh, unmanned battle tanks. Do you mean on, nukes? On the other side. Huh? Do you mean nukes? Well, you can have nukes, you can have long range missile systems, you can have jamming systems. Um, but the drones are so much cheaper. Doesn't it democratize access to violence? Well, it's actually, a little bit of a fallacy that drones are much, much cheaper. Certainly a US Reaper drone, which is sort of the, currently the standard US strike drone is a lot cheaper than uh, a jet fighter, uh, probably by an order of magnitude. Um, but it has nowhere near the capabilities of a jet fighter. Um, and it's still expensive enough that you're not just going to, you know, let loose and wild with these drones. I mean, they cost $15 million each. So uh, it's going to be uh, not long before you decide that actually, you know, by the time 10 of them have been shot down, you're really losing the battle. Um, one of the concerns, though, is that we will get to the point where that cost calculus changes and we have swarms of drones. Uh, I, I've spent quite a lot of time doing research on anti-drone technology, also known as counter-drone technology. And uh, there are a lot of ways to shoot down drones, even you know, small commercially available drones. But there are no counter-drone technologies available today that would be effective against a swarm of, say, 500 Russian drones that are coming in at you and they each have a five pound explosive on them. Um, that being said, people are working very quickly on some kind of solution. Well, speaking of which, that, there was that drone at the airport incident, and I've got to imagine we're going to start having more of these. Talk about the anti-drone technologies, where we're at with that, sure. and how they so work. The incident that you're referring to uh, happened in late December of last year, um, actually on the busiest travel day of the year at one of the busiest airports in the world, Gatwick Airport in, in London. Um, and someone, we still don't know who, uh, flew a drone repeatedly over the runways. Obviously, if there's a drone flying over the runways, and this again is a small commercially available drone, it's probably about this big. 
Um, you can't land any aircraft, you can't take any aircraft off. And so the airport was closed for 36 hours. And I got a lot of calls from reporters that day and they all asked the same question. I mean, is, it, is there nothing we can do? And the answer is, it's, it's harder than you think. One, you can't shoot at these drones because you're in the middle of one of the most densely populated areas in the world. And if you shoot at the drone, you're gonna to have to use 50 bullets, say. Maybe one bullet hits the drone, 49 bullets are gonna to have to come down somewhere. Uh, so that's unsafe. You can use uh, jamming, what's called jamming. It's a technique to basically interrupt the radio communications link between the drone and the person operating the drone. Uh, Gatwick did not have one of those systems on hand. There are also questions about how effective those systems are at range. And there is always the possibility that the drone doesn't even have a radio communications link. Um, there have been experiments with lasers to shoot down drones. Again, very, very dangerous in a civilian setting. That makes much more sense in, say, an active battlefield. Uh, experiments with nets, for example. Um, what about suicide drones? You just drive a couple kamikazes into another drone. Of course, suicide drones too. But for anybody who's had any experience flying a drone, and I'm, I'm sure there are many listeners uh, to this program who have drones of their own, they'll be able to tell you very quickly that is much harder than it sounds. I mean, if you have a drone that is hovering in place, nice and smooth and steady, yeah, you could probably crash into it. But what if your adversary's drone is operating in a very evasive way? Some of these drones are incredibly fast and agile. I mean, if you've ever seen drone racing, these drones can do 80 miles an hour um, and somersaults and backflips and all sorts of incredible things uh, like that. So there are a few companies that claim that they can, they have kamikaze drones that are effective. Also companies that claim that they, uh, that their drones, which have net cannons mounted underneath the drone can go and hunt the uh, intruding drone and shoot it down with a net. One of those companies has received a lot of venture capital funding. Um, but again, I'm still somewhat unconvinced. Apparently these systems operate on AI, so you're not even using a human pilot to shoot down the enemy drone. Um, but I sort of want to see it before I believe it. And again, that will be effective if you're only going up against one other drone. But what if you've got five interceptor drones and your adversary has 10 drones, then you've lost the battle, right? And it's much harder to play defense than it is to play offense at almost anything. Absolutely, and this is no exception. So when you think about drones, there's a lot of pros, there's some cons as well. What are the big ones that don't get highlighted enough on both? In terms of the pros, people are, are often talking uh, a lot about delivery drones. Jeff Bezos made uh, global headlines in 2013 when he announced that he was going to start delivering goods to con customers uh, using drones in 30 minutes or less from the moment of purchase. Uh, there have been experiments with medical delivery drones, for example. So Rwanda has a very extensive program where they use drones to deliver urgent medical goods vaccines, blood transfusions, uh, urgent medications to remote clinics. Um, that takes much less time than it would to transport those same goods over roads. Um, those are the popular ones. But actually, some of the real sort of uh, positive utility of drones um, comes from things that are a little less sexy, if you will. So infrastructure inspections is a really good one. Previously, if you had a bridge, it was getting kind of old, you wanted to get a sense of whether uh, it was still structurally integral, you'd have to send someone up in a harness. Same goes for a cell tower or a power line. Um, now, a lot of companies are using drones to inspect those sorts of structures. They can do it very quickly, uh, they can do it very cheaply, and most importantly, they don't put anyone's lives at risk. Uh, another one is insurance appraisals. People don't really think about this very often, but 
after say a really heavy storm, uh, you will have a geographic area where lots of houses have sustained damage to their rooftops. Previously, the insurance companies would have to send appraisers to climb up these rooftops, onto these rooftops, and inspect visually the damage and take photographs and send those back. Every year, multiple appraisers fell off rooftops doing exactly that and sustained really serious injuries or died. Now, the insurance industry often uses drones to do exactly that. You spend $2,000 on a camera drone. It takes five minutes to do the inspection. You have really high quality data. If you have some uh, computer processing software uh, or image processing software rather, you will be able to create a very detailed 3D model of the rooftop. So that's actually better data than you would have been able to get with a, um, with a human appraiser. And no one's, no one's life is at risk. You can do some of things with agriculture, for example, uh, conservation. Uh, drones have been proven to be very effective for animal population counts uh, and much less invasive than, than having human counters. I mean, the list really goes on. That's on the positive side. On the negative side, well, you can ruin 400,000 people's holiday travel plans by shutting down one of the busiest airports in the world for 36 hours. Um, you can go a step further, uh, and not to put an idea in anybody's head, but you could strap explosives to that drone and try and fly it into someone. Um, in 2013, there was this famous incident where Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, was uh, giving a public speech in, in an open air venue and um, someone flew a drone within a few meters of her. Now, this drone did not have any explosives on it, but everybody suddenly realized, wait a second, if that drone had a grenade on it, they probably could have killed her. Um, it was like you the, can also, the Kennedy moment. You don't ride in the you don't ride in the presidential yeah, car exactly. with the top off anymore. Very much so. Uh, the, the, as soon as that happened, probably the security details for every major world leader said, "Oh, okay, we've got to be looking up as well. <laughs> you know, we've got to take into account the the sky as well as all the other things that we have to worry about." Um, you can use drones to intrude on people's privacy. I mean, that is um, just a fact. There have been uh, dozens of incidents in the last few years where people have been in their apartments in high-rise buildings, just you know, going about their business, or in some cases getting changed or coming out of the shower, and there's been a, a drone hovering right outside, taking 4K video of what they're doing. And invariably in those cases, when the, the victims call the police, by the time the cops show up, the drone is long gone, and so is the person operating it. Um, you can also use drones for um, government surveillance, and we know that that can sometimes be a concern too. Uh, you know, by and large, law enforcement agencies are not trying to needlessly intrude on people's privacy when they don't need to, but uh, history has shown that uh, surveillance tools in the hands of governments can sometimes be abused and uh, drones are no exception uh, to that. Um, those are some of the main ones, I'd say. And governments like to sweep up as much data as they can. It's, uh, it's like a fishing expedition, so to seek. If we can find anything there, perfect, then we have people to prosecute. How do you think about that from the US side and then from the China side? We've got social credit, we've got NSA, yeah. and they're both two sides of a different coin. You know, in a way, they're both scary. Uh, they're scary for somewhat different reasons. Uh, the US does not have a, an incredibly strong track record of keeping its surveillance technology tightly controlled and uh, only using it in ways that uh, align perfectly with uh, you know, your or my sense of what counts as a legitimate use. Um, that continues to be the case today. And in light of that, it's particularly worrying that a lot of these surveillance technologies are incredibly powerful. I mean, the US is really, along with Israel and China, uh, at the very forefront of developing surveillance technology. It always has been. 
Fortunately, in the United States, uh, there are some very robust structures in place that can be used as a counterweight to any potential abuses. We have a constitution. We have the Fourth Amendment, which protects everybody against unreasonable search and seizure. So if you're doing something in your own home, a policeman cannot just knock down the door without a warrant, because that would be a, a violation of your privacy and of your Fourth Amendment rights. If you look at China, on the other hand, none of those controls on government power exist. And so uh, they really have uh, no reason to hold themselves back. Um, and pat particularly worrying on that note is that China has really advanced its capabilities in the last few years. I mean, this wasn't a discussion even three years ago because China was still somewhat behind the curve in terms of its CCTV technology, for example, in terms of its um, you know, social media monitoring activity. Uh, now what we're realizing is that China isn't just using this extensively, it's actually a global leader in this technology. And not only that, whereas by and large uh, US firms uh, have tended to be a little more discerning about who they sell their surveillance technology to. Now, that's not true across the board, uh, but it, it, there is some level of accountability um, because companies are cognizant of sort of the public uh, perception side of things. Um, China will probably sell its surveillance gear to anybody who wants to pay for it. Uh, so we're not just talking about a contained issue in the western provinces of China where the Uyghur population uh, is concentrated and where a lot of the surveillance activity is concentrated. We're talking about any autocratic state that could find a use and a very dangerous use for this gear. And so we really need to be talking about China. And I think we have every reason to be worried. And in theory, authoritarianism, dictatorship, it's really a function of the ability to monitor and process information, both of which have exponentially increased in the, the past 10, 20 years. Do, do, yeah, do these technologies ultimately make the, do they ultimately make those type of states, which in the past seemed impossible to last, impossible to unlast, to get rid of, because the monitoring can be so extreme? There are in a way two answers to that question. Uh, one answer is that yes, absolutely. Uh, surveillance technology has the potential to make power more vicious, more entrenched, and it has the potential to further rig that contest between the weak and the strong. There's no doubt about that. And that's the pessimistic analysis of where we stand right now. Um, and I think it's a very valid analysis. But there is a different way of seeing things. Um, a lot of the reason why surveillance technology is becoming so powerful today is because of digital technologies. And digital technologies have also empowered the population tremendously and have connected us in all sorts of ways that uh, just the a decade or so ago, we wouldn't have thought possible. Uh, these have given us ways to uh, keep power uh, to account. They have given us ways to uh, organize and speaking truth to power. Um, and they have given us ways ultimately to find uh, routes around surveillance technology. We have encrypted messaging apps, for example. Um, even my smartphone has a level of encryption upon it. Um, and the uh, manufacturer of uh, the phone is not going to hand my data over to the cops uh, without a court order. That creates a natural firewall that didn't necessarily exist at a time when all of our calls and communications went through physical wires under the ground that the police could literally tap into. Um, so, you know, 
I, I think that there is some reason to be cautiously optimistic on that front. And then a final piece is that really in the last couple of years, we have begun to take notice of the fact that our privacy is facing an existential threat and that we need to be much more judicious about how we give up our data, for example. Uh, people are spending more time demanding that Facebook act responsibly with our personal data. Same goes for Google and other uh, companies. We have a much higher level of public consciousness about these things. I think the golden age of companies and governments sucking up our data, whole hog, uh, are perhaps numbered for that reason. And in theory, as a result, you could see something of a sea change where people realize that the policy has to catch way up to the technology. And, um, and we'll, we would, in theory, begin to see robust protections come into place as a result of that. Um, but it's still a little hard to tell. So I am, as I said, both pessimistic and at the same time optimistic about our prospects looking forward. Is that a reality or a perception though? Because what I see is very few people quit Facebook. The most people are like, oh God, this is the worst. Let's bitch and whine about it like our boss or the fact that I left my shoes out and it rained. But you know what? That's how it is. And yeah. I can look at cat pictures. There's that side of things where yeah. people don't really seem to, to, to care. And then there's the other side of things. What real motivation does, let's say the US government have? I can see the European one because it's a different story. But the US government have for regulating these types of data protection when they are ultimately the end consumer of that. If they need anything, they go to Facebook and say, hey, Zuck, we're going to need this now or you're going to jail. And it's kind of a, yeah, it's a... Well, that, that analysis sort of assumes that everybody in government wants to suck up as much personal data as possible. And that's not actually the truth. I have, uh, through my work, spent a lot of time um, talking with people in the intelligence agencies. Um, and based on those interactions, I can say that the perception that the government wants to sort of see everything at all times and intrude on our privacy in a way that you or I would consider to be needless is actually a sort of unfounded uh, do you think individual members of the government or the government as a whole? For instance, a mob doesn't want to burn a car, but somebody wants to burn a car. So then the mob goes and burns the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly there is that idea of sort of uh, eminence um, coming out of not uh, individuals, but groups. Uh, I'd say that there, there is enough of a voice within government um, certainly on the legislative side, there are a number of Congress people who uh, care seriously uh, about privacy. There are uh, inspector generals in every federal agency that uh, look at data management um, policies and data collection policies, even the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which um, uh, has um, not the best history of, uh, you know, um, sort of surveillance practices. Um, we'll do a privacy impact assessment of every new uh, surveillance technology that they uh, that they that they adopt. Um, I think, as again, I'm you know, I'm I'm I, I'm. I'm, I'm seeing that you've got somewhat of the, the pessimistic take on things, which I share very much. And so my natural instinct is to give you the sort of opposing side. I think that the optimist in me says that, you know, there, there will be more of a consciousness and a sensitivity to these issues as groups come to realize just how much power this technology gives us. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of legislative action. San Francisco, for example, tech capital of the world, just implemented a very robust municipal ordinance that places a set of rigorous and very reasonable controls on the use of surveillance technology by any city agency. 
And that ordinance also uh, includes a um, total ban on the use of facial recognition by any, any government um, agency. Uh, that's a positive sign. That's a step in the right direction. We didn't see ordinances like that a couple of years ago. And now the seed of Silicon Valley is at the forefront of, of pushing for that. And we also have an independent judiciary. The ACLU, uh, for example, when it sees a government agency or a local government using a surveillance technology in a way that violates the constitution, it will take it to court. And often they will win. And as a result of that, we have all sorts of privacy protections now that we didn't used to have. For example, the, the Supreme Court recently ruled that uh, law enforcement could not get your cell phone company to hand over an archive of your location data without a warrant. Before then, law enforcement agencies around the country submitted thousands of requests for people's location data without having to submit a warrant for it. That's changed. That's a step in the right direction. So again, playing a little bit of the devil's advocate, I want to be the optimist, the your pessimist, but if I'm you were being well. overly optimistic about all of this stuff, I can assure you I'd be taking on, uh, uh, on, on your side of the discussion. Yeah, the, the big problem I have is the slippery slope. We had 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. look at the landslide that changed in everything after that. Every, every terrorist attack, big or small, is a slippery slope towards 1984. And with power, power rarely cuts back on itself. It only grows. Yeah. So that's that's my big deal. What technology? What technologies are you most optimistic about outside of what we talked about today? That's a good question. Um, well, you know, again, I, I I think that drones can be used in all sorts of uh, positive ways. I think that if you employ artificial intelligence responsibly, you can do all sorts of incredible things, uh, not just in terms of holding governments to account, but, you know, uh, speeding up the process of diagnosing illnesses. And so that's pretty, uh, it's a pretty common one. Um, there are reasons to be, um, to embrace some of this stuff. Um, but the missing ingredient, I think the part that we really haven't been so good at in the past is that we have charged toward the development of a particular technology with one narrow application in mind. So for the sake of argument, I will invent a, a scientist who is developing a computer vision algorithm to detect early stage cancer. Uh, and they are narrowly focused on that particular goal and they develop a really formidable capability as a result. Well, as it turns out, that exact algorithm can just as easily be used to uh, count the number of protesters at a legal peaceful rally and then track them back to their houses so that now you have a perfect list of the home addresses of everyone who participated in this rally. Um, the, the, the scientist in this analogy was aware that that was a possibility, but said, that's not my problem because- I think I'm a lot of times they don't even think about it. They're just optimists. Yeah, or they'll say, well, you know, that's not what I'm developing. I'm developing, I'm developing it for a positive application. Uh, I've heard that many, many times from people I've spoken to in the, in the technology space. Well, you know, we're only using this technology for military applications, so um, we have no reason to worry about the privacy stuff because it's never going to make that jump. I think if we just look at history a little bit and see that that has rarely been the case, that maybe we could be a little bit more responsible in how we develop these technologies. And Lord forbid, even develop protections before the technology is deployed, rather than whiplash and try and rush a policy, something that's very difficult in this fragmented uh, political age, once the cat is out of the bag, so to speak. 
Do you think humans are capable of that? A lot of times I would argue that we need, like for instance, to unify people on earth, we're going to need aliens to attack because we need someone else to hate so that we can join together. There has to be some type of motivating factor to get people because human beings are inherently lazy. What we want to do is survive in the easiest way possible. That's what we've evolved to do. Mm. And anything that violates that, if it doesn't really affect our survival, well, shoot, I'm going to go to McDonald's and yeah, I'm going yeah. to get more. Well, it's possible we're getting to a point where surveillance actually is an existential threat, you know, on the scale of climate change or nuclear weapons. Uh, now, the jury's still out when it comes to climate change, but suddenly when it came to nuclear weapons, there was a global movement uh, calling for nuclear test treaty bans. And for the better part of 40 years, a lot of those non-proliferation treaties actually worked very well. Because while humans are lazy, we recognize that there was an existential threat. It's but we still, we still weren't able to give up that advantage we had and start destroying yeah, but, some you know, of the there are only, what is it, a dozen countries that have nuclear weapons. And not every country has nuclear weapons. And we, we've great. got like 10,000. Yeah. Oh no. Look, it's it's a huge problem. Yeah. Um, it's a... uh, there were there were measures and pretty drastic measures taken to counter the threat. In one sense, the the cat with surveillance technology is completely out of the bag. Um, the cat with nuclear weapons is completely out of the bag. There's no putting it back in the bag. Um, but again, trying to be the optimist here. Um, you know, if we get to a point where we realize that it's an existential threat, then we'll, we'll, we'll try and act. I'm not ruling out the possibility that it will never get to that point and we will just find ourselves in a world where our personal privacy is uh, eroded to a point of non-existence. Um, but I'm, I'm not yet ready to rule it out. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an example of this book I just wrote. Um, there have been numerous instance, instances of law enforcement agencies uh, trying to employ this very, very powerful all-seeing aerial surveillance technology over their cities. And they haven't. And they haven't because of public pushback. It wasn't because of some moral compunction that suddenly caused them to hold back and say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do it. It was because the population actually rose up and said, no, we don't want this. This is a step too far. We understand that privacy is important. We understand that law enforcement has to do what law enforcement do and try and reduce crime in our city. But we don't want an unblinking, persistent, all-seeing eye flying over our heads. That was a step too far. Uh, in fact, there is at the moment no uh, single city that at least has a public wide area airborne surveillance program. There may be cities that have secret ones. Um, and the reason for that is because there has been a democratic process where the population has said no and governments have listened. I feel like with autonomous vehicles, the easiest way to get them to roll out because no one's going to get into a car where I tell you, so here's this trolley problem. We've got these old ladies and these little kids over here. So we can't hit that. So I'm going to drive you into a wall instead. Nobody's going to hop into that car. We have to lie to them and tell them we're going to run over those guys and you'll be safe. Mm. So the easiest way to roll out something like that would be via a lie. And then, Oh, guess what? Actually, that's not how it is, but now everything's perfectly safe. Could you see a situation where that happens with surveillance? Let's not talk about it until everything's perfect. And, oh, look, we got rid of 99% of the crime we had. Isn't this incredible what we accomplished? No, I don't think so. Because we have investigative journalists, we have community activists, we have lawyers, we have uh, groups like the Project on Government Oversight and the ACLU, uh, civil society at large, uh, all of those actors in a democratic system act to make sure that that doesn't happen. And they've been pretty good at making sure that doesn't happen in the past. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I have faith in them, that, that process. I think, in fact, the, mo the moment we begin to lose faith in 
civil society and media and community activism, uh, then we're in trouble because then those forces are undermined. Uh, the second that we say, well, the media is biased, uh, the media only has fake news, uh, then we lose the power of the fourth estate. And the reason the fourth estate is important is because the second uh, an investigative reporter gets a tip off that the city of Baltimore, for example, is using a military grade surveillance camera, they rush to their office, do a bunch of fact checking calls, get a comment from the BPD, the Baltimore Police Department, and then run a story. And then the community sees that story and says, oh my goodness, Baltimore Police Department is spying on us. We need to do something about that. And they make demands that this program be canceled and then the program gets canceled. That is actually something that happened in Baltimore in August of 2016 while I was writing the book. And now Baltimore doesn't have wide area aerial surveillance. <laughs> but if everyone had said, oh no, there's a conspiracy uh, that the media wants us to, you know, unthink all these things that aren't actually true. And everyone had seen that uh, investigative report and said, oh no, that's a biased journalist. We have no reason to believe her. Then that wouldn't have happened. So if anything, I, I think that we double down on the, uh, the measures that we have in place. And that is our best chance. How dangerous is Trump's fake news rhetoric? Do you think we're at a tipping point or do you think that will recover? I, I don't want to get into that. You know, I'm, okay. I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on Trump's rhetoric. I, I, you know, I talk about surveillance technology. Um, so I'd, I'd leave that for other experts on this show. Not a problem, not a problem. Okay, I want to jump into the bonus Patreon questions, guys. So what we're going to be doing now with each episode, because we want to make this more sustainable, we're going to have a couple of questions we ask each guest that only Patreon supporters will be able to access. So if you got Patreon and you've decided to back us at disruptors.fm slash Patreon, you'll get this. If not, we're going to jump back towards the end of the episode and we'll see you back in a sec. Ask questions. So related to local journalism that we were talking about in the bonus episode, bonus questions, what do you think about this rise of billionaires buying news organizations, so to speak, in terms of how that potentially affects the media? Is it a good, good progression, bad progression, neutral? Again, uh, Matt, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a media academic, um, so I'll, I'll leave that question to somebody else. Not a problem, not a problem. This has been a, this has been a super fun one. If you were going to leave people with one quote, one call to action, what would it be and why? Uh, well, by my book, I think that could be a good... <laughs> oh, we'll, get, we'll get to that too. Don't worry. We'll tell that, them. That, that could be a, a, a good start. Um, you know, read the news. I think that I know it can be really demoralizing to read the news these days. and there is often an, an, an instinct to sort of turn away in, in an act of, of, of cynicism, but it's, it's a civic duty. That being said, if you feel like you read the news too much, then give yourself a two week break from the news. When you come back, it'll all still be there, but just give yourself a break, do something else, go hiking. And I can assure you when you come back, you'll be even better prepared to fight the good fight. And I'm going to double down on that and say, even if you don't feel like you read the news too much, if you are someone who's on the news or social media a lot, try a two week break and see how you feel after. It'll give you a, it'll give you a lot of perspective either way on how your life is and where you want it to go. I couldn't agree more. This has been a fun one. Where can people find you, the book, check it out, get themselves a drone, have some fun. Yeah, certainly. So um, you can find my book at any major bookstore. You can also uh, order it online if you type in my name and Eyes in the Sky. I'm sure you'll include a link uh, when you post this podcast. Um, you can also order the audio book, which was read by the great LJ Ganser. It's a really fun listen if you commute a lot, if you're on the road a lot. Uh, you can also uh, check out my personal website, arthurholandmichelle.com. Uh, that has uh, updates about my uh, ongoing book tour and my other projects that I have 
uh, going on. And if you're really interested in drones, uh, you can check out the Center for the Study of the Drone at Bard College. If you Google that, our website will uh, come out. We've got a lot of really useful information on everything from Amazon's drone plans to counter drone technology to military drone proliferation. Uh, we continue to put out a number of really cutting edge research reports uh, on some of the most pressing policy challenges when it comes uh, to drones. And we also have a, a really cool newsletter that goes out on Monday mornings, which is, uh, I think, uh, one of the better ways to stay on top of everything that's happening in uh, the world of drones. You can subscribe to that uh, on our website. Um, I think that's it. What is Bezos planning with drones? <laughs> well, they actually just released a new design for their Amazon uh, Prime Air delivery drone system. It's a pretty unusual design. I encourage you to Google it and uh, you'll see that it doesn't really look like a drone that you could buy on Amazon. Um, the hope is that it will be there for those last mile deliveries. So you have a fulfillment center that is perhaps only five miles as the crow flies from the consumer that just pressed, clicked buy on that iPad case. Uh, instead of having a van take a really meandering circuitous route to try and uh, include as many other people who've bought goods in that same area, a drone will get uh, that iPad case placed in its underbelly. It'll take off, shoot right over to you, drop the, the, the package with a tether and fly right back in 15 minutes or less. And in theory, it could even be much, much cheaper than the other delivery methods. Uh, so that's the vision. There are still a lot of technical and regulatory challenges, uh, but it's all happening. And it'll be a much more sustainable way of doing it if we pull it off. I imagine they would use solar or something similar. Versus yeah, solar. let's hope. This has been a fun one, Arthur. Thanks for coming on. Guys, if you have enjoyed this, you know what to do. If you run a company or startup and you're interested in advertising, you think that your product or mission would be something that our listeners would be interested in and we'd actually support, then reach out, Matt at, the, Matt at disruptors.fm. And until next time, I'll talk to you guys soon. Cheers. Thank you. Man. Thank you. Awesome. That was fun. Okay, great. Let me, uh, uh,